Good morning. We've got a little mapping to do today and some work on the gator. So we're gonna go and do that after we get the gas tank full. All right, Brock is here. He's gonna take our electric fence down around our sweet corn. We're done with it. It did its job, kept the coons out. So while he goes and works on that, I need to go place some flags for uh, that fence that our one landlord's kids, grandkids are gonna put up. So we're gonna run up there. I've got the GPS stuff and we can mark that out. Okay, so that house over there, they wanna put up some fence for a pasture. That's great. I have no problems with that. In fact, it'll make the field better because they're gonna square stuff off and we don't have so many crooked endros. Um, but I would like to do it even with a even planter pass from the edge of the field and this Is the edge of the field where we always start. It's a straight shot So we're gonna put the center of the gator which is pretty close right on the line right there And we're gonna mark an a B line. So we're gonna get the right field brought up here, which I do have uh, Set track we want it to be main south side Okay so that track is straight with this side of the field. That's the guidance line that we always use when we use pull into this field. So we're gonna just pull ahead a little bit to make sure our GPS knows exactly where we're at, okay? We are right on that line. That purple line there, or pink line, is the boundary, the outside edge of the field. And we're going to shift this track so it is right in the center. So now, the next one there is gonna be the end of my 40 foot planter pass, right? So we're 40 foot track spacing. So if I go to that next one, that is right between where the rows will be from the first planter pass and the second planter pass. That's the information that I need because now we're gonna go down over there by the house where they wanna put their fence and we're gonna find one that's either um, between a planter pass or exactly 20 feet off of it. I'll try not to drive over too many of my double crop beans. Uh, and that way we don't have uh, you know, like four row gap or a six row gap or something that we've got to try and piece it in and it's, it works out a little bit even, more even. This is not critical. It is not a big deal at the end of the world, but before they put the fence up, if I could come up here and just help them say, hey, it'd be great if you could put it here, it makes life easier later and it just, it's a, it's a nice thing. So we're going to do it. All right. So he's got a uh, flag there that that's where they wanted to put their fence. That white one right in front of the gator is an even planter pass, so I, he said he wants to have, you know, a lane to be able to mow around and stuff. He's just about perfect. I told him, you know, stay five foot off of that flag or something and, and you'll be good. I put some down there for him. Uh, it's a little wider than what he was is going to do on his own or whatever on this side, but the other side went out a little farther. It's fine. It's going to work. They've actually got her worked down and seeded alfalfa in it already, so... Um, few cows. They're going to raise some cows out here. Freezer beef. All right, now I've got to go hang out at, uh, at my seed warehouse. I'll tell you why when I get there. I don't want to tell you, but I will. Okay, so if you watched yesterday's video, you know that uh, my black truck, my Chevy truck um, was started a little rough or was out of gas. I don't know. I put gas in it and then I took it home last night so that I could put, um, fill it up with gas. And it's fine now. It works. Uh, there's another reason I took it home though last night. This one. My new Ram that I just had at the dealer on Monday and Tuesday for them to fix a freaking headlight turn signal. Watch what happens. Watch. Nothing. It acts dead like the engine won't turn over, but it's not dead. Because all the lights work, the running boards, well, they used to work. Why didn't the running board go out? I don't know. I don't know what's going on. All right, well, um, I got my truck started. Check it out, we're driving it. Uh, I had to get the battery charger and put the charger on the battery. It was acting super weird. It wasn't wanting to do anything. It was just like it was totally dead, but the, I don't know. I can't imagine that it's just a battery went bad all of a sudden. I mean, it's been hot, but I don't know. And before you guys all start, yes, I know. It's a Ram, blah, blah, blah. Buy a Ford, buy a Chevy. I'm about ready to trade it on a Chevy. I will tell you that. But I'm not, I don't know what the heck is going on. So fortunately, it's brand new. So it's still all under warranty. It is a major, 
major, minor, minor, major inconvenience having to deal with this right now, but uh, it's not the end of the world. So I'm going to take it back to the dealer. I told them I got it started and I'm going to bring it down and they were going to get me a loaner car and I imagine they'll have it for a week and I won't see it for a while, but what are you going to do, right? So um, at least I have options. <sighs> Frustrating. That's what this is. Frustrating. It seems to run fine check engine lights on but it runs fine so maybe there'll be something in the codes I don't know all right well I'm dropping it off here um, we drove it here fine it even I even forgot to disable the start stop feature you know that they put on these new vehicles and it's I stopped at a stop sign it shut off it started right back up no problem whatsoever uh, but I got here and I didn't want to shut it off because I'm like, oh, what if it doesn't start again and uh, they came out read the codes there were 70 some codes stored in there which I'm pretty sure was cleared on Tuesday when I picked it up from the same place. And uh, then she shut it off and put her foot on the brake, tried to restart it, and it wouldn't start. So something is clearly wrong. Hopefully they'll figure it out. Who knows when I'll see it again, but what are we gonna do? So now I have a Grand Cherokee loaner that we get to drive for who knows how long. All right, truck stuff is behind us. Uh, it rained a little bit while I was on my way back. With you raindrops. Yep. Anyway, um, Brock and I are going over to the field. I'm going to teach him how to map tile lines. Actually, I'm going to teach myself and he's going to watch and then he'll learn because I don't really know either. Okay, so we're out here where we just finished tiling, right? The tile guys are all their stuff still here. Well, they're going to do the field next door, so they're just leaving it here, but we want to make a GPS map of all of these tile lines and um, our the guys that install the tile, they use a laser system. They don't use a GPS RTK for depth control, grade control, so they don't map the tile lines as they're doing it, which is fine, because um, we have the ability to do so. Now, Dad worked all these tile lines down with our disc ripper and the uh, 8R that's sitting over there on the other side of the ditch, and it would have been much easier to put this in there and map them as it was being ripped, but Dad didn't do that or I didn't get it in there fast enough for him to want to do it, something. I don't know, I yeah, my fault. Anyway, so we're gonna do it here. And um, basically we're creating a flag layer. So I've got this flags tab pulled up and then we have two flags there, a uh, tile main and a four inch tile. The four inch are the laterals, the mains are usually six or eights or whatever. I don't know what they are, that's why we're just calling them mains. And um, we're just driving right on top of where the tile lines are, and then when we get to the end, we hit the button and it, it, it ends the flag. I didn't show you how it started because Brock pushed it before I could start recording it, but anyway, we just keep following this until till the end of the run, and this one in particular curves around here, so I'll, I'll show you in a second. Okay, so the end of this tile is somewhere about right oh here. So we're just gonna hit that button, and it turns off, and then we go to the next one, and somehow or another, Nope, don't want that. Uh, uh, hold on, let me find it. There, we can pull up the whole field and those are the black lines there are the ones that we've done. So when we're done here, you should be able to see all the tile lines and where they're at and yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've only got like 65 acres of this to do. We can do it. Won't take a while. So this map will be useful if ever in the future we need to find a tile line for any reason. And um, it happens, like where I'm building my house, we tiled that field a few years ago and did this, made GPS lines in it. Super helpful for, for finding them and where they all went and knowing which direction they all go and stuff. Um, in this particular field, what are we gonna use them for? I have no idea, but maybe we need to add one somewhere or know exactly where they're at or we're digging something up and we want to know i don't know but we're gonna have them and now's the time to do it so we're in the back corner of this field that we tiled this is where dad hauled all that dirt in look at it man he did a great job they were even able to tile right through all this would not have been able to tile this if he hadn't put all this extra dirt in because there wasn't enough cover it was uh, it was too low we got her all fixed up now this is where Dad took all the dirt from. He did a really nice job. Nice and smooth and level. Could use a light tillage pass just to loosen some dirt up and seed it to some grass. Or maybe they want to farm it, I don't know. We do need to level all that stuff out. That's the spoils that they dug out of the ditch when they cleaned the ditch out. Um, thought they were gonna use their dozer for that, but the dozer left, so I don't know if we're gonna bring it back or what. All right, well, we're not done, but we did all of those lines. 
and it's lunchtime, so Brock can come back and finish this after lunch. All right, well, we got something to eat, and we're back here. Um, I've been waiting for this afternoon to do some more spraying. I've got uh, I got to kill the mare's tail, those weeds, and my double crop beans, and uh, Roundup doesn't do it. Um, mare's tail is the one really Roundup resistant weed that we fight and that we struggle with, and so. Um, we gotta put something else in there, and we're gonna use Liberty. So I've got some Liberty, I've had it for all year, or since June, and um, we didn't need it in the other beans, but uh, we're gonna use it in the double crops. So uh, I have never sprayed Liberty before. Dad did a little bit earlier this year, but not very much, so I gotta do a little research and label reading to figure out exactly what it is that uh, I need to put in it. I know we need to use this ammonium sulfate, but I don't know exactly how much, and we are gonna tank mix Roundup in with it because we have all that volunteer weed up there that we need to kill off too, so. We're gonna get it ready to go, but I gotta figure out a few things before we load up the sprayer. Okay, so here's what I know about Liberty, and I knew some of this before, but I just wanted to read the label to make sure that I was right. Um, one, it has to be hot and sunny um, for it to actually work really well, which is why we waited till this afternoon and for the sun to come out and it to get hot, which, check, we have. Um, you have to use ammonium sulfate, which is what is in our bags there. So we're going to use, it says 17 pounds per 100 gallons. Uh, we're going to put three bags in for a 1,000 gallon load. That's close enough. Um, quart to the raker is the, is the rate. And it is a contact herbicide, which means it is not systemic. It is not going to get into the plant and translocate to the roots like glyphosate will. Uh, so we have to coat the plants, which means high gallonage. So... We're spraying 20 gallons to the acre of, of water with a quart of Liberty in it, um, which means lots and lots of water, and we can't do it on one trip. So 50 acres on a fill. Oh, well, 50 acres on a 1,000-gallon fill. We can do a little bit more than that, but it just works out better so I don't have to split a jug, and we can use a full even rate. So that would be 12 and a half gallons um, on our first load here. Since we are spraying a herbicide and not a fungicide or an insecticide, we need to switch our nozzles. Uh, coverage is still super important, especially with the Liberty, but uh, we don't need that super fine droplet that's trying to penetrate the canopy as much, because quite honestly, we don't have a, pan a canopy to penetrate. So instead of the twin jets, we're going to run the single, single hole nozzles, this one, and um, yeah. I get to switch all these. All right, so like I said, we are gonna run glyphosate with this. Um, I did spray part of this field with Roundup already. I could try and do one load with it, one load without, but it's just not worth it. And so uh, I'm just gonna put it in. It takes eight and a half gallons to do 50 acres, 8.6. Um, the mixing order here is kind of important. The first thing we wanna put in is the AMS. And what that's doing is actually conditioning the water it lowers the pH because it, it's an acid or it acidifies it. Uh, that ties up the calcium and some of the minerals that's in our well water and keeps them from tying up the herbicide before it gets to the plant. So that has to go in first. Then we add our Roundup. The Liberty doesn't go in until the tank is basically full because it will foam up like crazy if you do put it in too soon. So that stays till the end. This is spray grade AMS, so we dump it straight into the adductor. It basically dissolves it in the water almost instantly, sucks it right into the solution system. Okay, well, that was an adventure. Just getting the chemical in there. Um, they aren't kidding when they said that it foams. We got a bit of a foam pile. Oh well, that's why we have a load pad. Anyway, um, I've only got, well, I was supposed to have 1,100 gallons, but I forgot about the volume of the chemicals, so I put 1,000 gallons of water in, and I ended up with almost 11.50, which is fine. We'll just put 21 gallons to the acre instead of 20 and we'll still get our rates right. But there's a lot of foam in that tank if it's coming out the overflow. Oh yeah, full of foam. So I know that they do have defoamers. I probably should have some for spraying Liberty. I don't. So we'll suffer through these two loads. And the next one, instead of using the adductor, I might just pour it right in the top of the tank there. Well, this view looks pretty much the same as what we had been doing. The spray pattern is a little different because it's all back instead of twin jets where you got one shooting forward. But um, 
Yeah. Right in this particular area of the field, there's not much for weeds. A few rounds over and in this back corner and definitely on the north side of it, there's a lot of mare's tails. So I decided not to attempt to spot spray it and just do the whole thing because you get little spots like right there. Those are mare's tail. We're going to kill them. Now, um, this is an added expense hitting this with the Liberty and the, the little bit more expensive chemicals. Liberty is a lot more expensive than just straight Roundup that we were spraying on the rest of the double crop stuff. This field here did not get the same wheat herbicide that the rest of them did. And that's why we have more mare's tail issues here because the uh, the wheat herbicide that we used on this field did not really do anything for mare's tail. It had no residual um, because we knew we were gonna plant double crop beans here and we didn't want any can carryover risks. Uh, we ended up taking that risk on a few other fields because the price of beans was so good and we had plenty of moisture and it was early and double crops made sense. Uh, but this was the field that we had intended to plant double crops in from the beginning. So we wanted to do everything we could to make sure we didn't um, have anything that would hurt the beans out here uh, with plant back intervals or restrictions and that kind of stuff. So that's why the issue is worse here. On the other wheat fields that we have that don't have double crop beans in them or the clover growing in them, um, we're going to spray them and, and kill that stuff off here in a couple of weeks before we get some chicken litter spread and then uh, uh, plant our cover crops in them. We're just going to use 2,4-D instead of Liberty because 2,4-D is a lot cheaper and there's no beans growing there and that would be off-label if I sprayed it on this field. I'm on the north side of the field here and there's a little sand ridge right in this front corner and you can see how bad the mare's tail is out here along with foxtail and volunteer wheat and ragweeds and everything else but that is why we've got the liberty in the tank all right i got the sprayer loaded up with the second load we got enough for 60 acres this time which is a full 1200 and uh we're ready to go to the field and spray it out i did dump the liberty in the top this time instead of um through the adductor it did not foam as bad there's still foam in the tank but not as much um they called me about my truck it's done it was a bad battery. I, I, I mean, I kind of thought it was a battery, but the fact that it wouldn't start at all as soon as I shut it off, like it didn't want to do anything, I didn't understand. But it must be something inside of it broke. I don't know. So we're going to go get that when I get back. All right, I am uh, just finishing spraying this out here. The water gallons left on. I got a round to do yet. Um, one thing that is different about this than what we were doing before is because we're spraying such high gallons, 20 gallons to the acre instead of 15 or 13 like most of the rest of the spraying we've been doing, I can't go as fast because we're getting too much pressure. I really need a size bigger nozzle to drive any faster, but 12 mile an hour, 11, 12 is all we're doing here and it's uh, keeping the pressure around 50 to 55. But um, yeah, when I started I was doing 15 and I had pressure at 80. I'm like, nope, that's not gonna work, that's too high. Uh, it creates too fine, fine droplets, you get drift concerns, and it's hard on everything around that higher pressure. So um, it takes a little longer. It takes a lot longer because you got to stop and fill twice as often, spraying high gallons, or not twice as often, but close to it. So anyway, we're almost done. Okay, well, I think we're done spraying for a while. Um, we're going to have to spray wheat stubble yet, the, the wheat stubble that we haven't done or haven't doesn't have double crops in it. Um, and we might do some for, some fall herbicide spray and trying to get ahead of stuff for next year. But I just pulled up this screen here. This tells me my job summaries. I reset this at the beginning of every year. We've sprayed over 10,000 acres this year. Almost 150,000 gallons run through it. And that's since March 17th when we started spraying nitrogen on wheat. So uh, we've, um, we've covered some ground with this sprayer. I always tell people, or I, I always think that... Um, Owning a sprayer is one of the biggest return on investment things that you can do because if we were hiring all that done, they're going to charge us six or seven dollars an acre at least to do that spraying. So uh, if it's six bucks an acre and we've sprayed 10,000, that's sixty thousand dollars that we would have paid in custom application fees. That, that makes a sprayer payment pretty easy, really easy, in fact. Now, granted, we have some expenses there with fuel and time and everything, but we also save a fair amount of money buying chemicals in January rather than now when it's in season and you don't have a choice but to buy it from the people that are applying it for you. So, 
that's that's a high return piece of equipment over there all right well since my truck is done we're gonna go get it so yeah it's um it's a little after four so it'll be five o'clock before we get back and then i'm gonna have to go so it probably won't be a whole lot else i don't know look at that she fired right up battery who would have thought all right well good deal all right guys well Thanks for watching today. Um, hope you guys have a great weekend. My wife and I are taking the boys to the monster truck show tonight, and they're gonna love it. So we gotta go, gotta go do that. And then tomorrow, Maddie and I are heading to Chicago for a wedding reception. I mean, it'll be okay. It is Chicago. I don't really want to go to Chicago, but it'll be all right. So we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Like, subscribe. If you have questions and comments, leave them down below. We'll see you guys. Cool.